We're going to talk here about one of the most common things that you will see both on the test and in the ED. It's very common to see this as well, and that's the patient complaining of a vague chest pain. Now, as we're going to see, patients who are older and complain of chest pain, by older I mean over the age of 50, we are typically very concerned of a cardiac cause. And so all patients over the age of 50 are going to get an EKG if they're complaining of chest pain. Now, on the other hand, younger patients usually, uh, in, in, in many cases, it's not cardiac. However, we are always uh, still, we, we always have our, uh, our ears open because we want to make sure that we're ruling out any possible cardiac cause because these tend to be uh, the things that can kill the patient. So, like I said, chest pain is one of the most frequent chief complaints in the ED, and the vast majority of patients that you see with chest pain are not going to be patients with anything acutely life-threatening. Uh, the reason people come in so much with chest pain is because people are very familiar that chest pain is associated with heart attacks, and there's a lot of anxiety around that, and rightly so. So a lot of people come in with chest pain, but the, the, only a very small minority are going to actually be patients with an MI. Nevertheless, you're going to have to approach all of these patients with the utmost index of suspicion, regardless of their age, regardless of their presenting symptoms, and so forth. So the general rule of thumb is that young patients, so patients younger than 50, that present with chest pain without any clear symptoms pointing to a non-cardiac cause, you're going to want to get an EKG. So if it's a young patient and you can't, on, on physical exam and on history, think of anything that is non-cardiac, then you'll want to get an EKG uh, to start out. On any older patient coming in with chest pain, an EKG should be your first step of choice. So like I said, there's a wide differential and you're going to want to know uh, the specifics about the nature of the chest pain. So we have the mnemonic PQRST, which helps us classify the pain and helps us place it in, in a category that might help us uh, come up with a diagnosis. And then you're going to want to know your distinguishing factors in the physical exam that are going to point to uh, specific diagnoses. So those are both going to be essential, knowing the nature of the pain and the accompanying symptoms. So this is the differential of chest pain, and of course this is not completely inclusive. I just put uh, the most common things that you should think of uh, when, when you have a patient with chest pain. As you can see, there's a, uh, there's a wide differential, uh, not just limited to cardiovascular and respiratory symptoms. So if you think about it, if you slice a patient right down the middle uh, at the heart, Think of all the things that, that go through there. You've got, of course, the heart, so any of your cardiovascular causes. You've got your lungs, and then you've got your esophagus, and really anything that's connected through the esophagus can refer there. Uh, you've got your liver and your gallbladder. Uh, you've got muscles. And then, of course, we also have to keep in mind psychiatric conditions. Anxiety can cause chest pain. Uh, and of course vice versa, so keeping in mind psychiatric conditions too. So the PQRST of pain. So the P stands for provoking and palliating. So we want to ask the patient uh, what makes the pain get better, if anything, and what makes the pain worse. So uh, is your chest pain, uh, does it feel better when you sit down and rest? Does it not? What makes the pain worse? These are things that you're going to want to keep an eye out for on your USMLE questions. And of course, when you're in the clinic, you're going to want to be asking uh, this of the patient. This is going to help you differentiate between the two different types of angina. And on the USMLE, it's going to help you figure out what your next step is going to be. Uh, Q stands for quality. So is this a sharp pain? Is this a dull pain? Is this a burning pain? Is this a crushing pain? How does it feel? Each of these are going to be very, very, very associated with uh, specific uh, differentials. So sharp pain is almost never associated with MI. Tearing pain is almost never associated with MI. 
Burning pain is usually associated with uh, reflux disease. Crushing and dull pain is usually going to be the pain that's most associated with MI. So you're going to want to know these different uh, key words. Sharp, dull, crushing, burning, uh, and so forth. Uh, so what's the exact region uh, and where does it refer? So where is the pain? Does it refer anywhere? Does it refer to the back? Does it refer to the shoulder? Is it in the abdomen? You're going to want to know uh, where exactly the chest pain is. Some patients will point exactly to their chest. When a patient points to their chest with a clenched fist, that's called a Levine sign, and that's associated with MI. So keep that in mind. Usually, when they point to their fist with a with a clenched or point to their chest with a clenched fist, that's a uh, that's a, a, a rather uh, specific sign for MI. Uh, not completely reliable, but something to, to keep an eye out for. Uh, so the severity, is it mild? Patients with MI are not going to have mild pain. Is the patient in distress? How do they rate the pain? And then the time, how long has the pain been going on? Has it been minutes? Has it been hours, days, weeks? How quickly did it come on? So the key physical findings for your diagnosis, you're going to want to know your initial impression. So is the patient calm? Are they distressed? Are they panicked? Is the patient still or are they antsy? You're going to want to know your vitals, particularly blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate. Heart rate and respiratory rate are going to, uh, if they're elevated, they're going to point towards likely pulmonary causes, PE or pneumothorax. Uh, and then, of course, breath sounds are going to be indispensable in diagnosing respiratory causes, too. So if the patient has pain when they're breathing, then you'd think of any of the pleuritic causes. So pneumothorax, PE, uh, pericarditis. Uh, are the breath sounds asymmetrical? So if you don't hear breath sounds on one side, then you're going to want to think pneumothorax. Uh, the heart sounds are going to be useful, too, if there's S2 splitting. Uh, that will point to uh, possibly a cardiac cause. If there's an S3 sound, which normally shouldn't be present, what the S3 is, is it's, uh, it's blood coming back, uh, coming into the ventricles uh, when there's already blood inside the ventricle. So that's congestive heart failure. And so if you have blood coming into a ventricle that already has blood in it, you'll, you'll get the S3 murmur. And that points towards, towards congestive heart failure. The S4 sound uh, is associated with left ventricular hypertrophy uh, and or infarction. And that's simply due to blood coming into a ventricle that's stiff. A pericardial rub is a friction-like sound that you'll hear uh, in, in your heart sounds. It's very difficult to differentiate it from, uh, from a murmur. Uh, so you'll be told a pericardial rub or a friction-like murmur uh, on, on the exam. Uh, in, in the clinic, in the hospital, it's very difficult to point these things out. Usually it takes a very trained ear. So be assured on the USMLE that you'll be told either a pericardial rub or a friction rub, uh, and that points to pericarditis. You'll want to look at your extremities as well. Uh, calf swelling will point to a, a pulmonary embolus, not due directly to the calf swelling, but if you have calf swelling, uh, that's going to be the source of, of, where your, uh, of, of where your embolus is coming from. And then the absence of pedal pulses points to aortic dissection, which causes a tearing chest pain. Okay, so some key symptoms for some of the non-cardiac causes. Remember that the GI tract goes straight through the chest down the diaphragm, and so anything that affects the esophagus, stomach, uh, can cause chest pain. So the first thing we think about is gastroesophageal reflux disease. This is a big one because it's so common. Now, with reflux disease, the pain tends to be after eating, so about one to two hours postprandial. In many cases, it's relieved by antacids, so these will be patients that are carrying Tums with them. They'll eat the Tums right after, uh, right after eating when they get their symptoms, and that will tend to give a little bit of relief. Other things that can give relief are things like milk, or maybe they take other antacids uh, like Prevacid or something like that. This pain will be described as burning, 
It typically originates in the stomach, usually right around that gastroesophageal junction, and it radiates upward. Uh, if they have a history of vomiting, that's a big red flag for reflux disease because what that vomiting is, it's just the reflux making it out. Uh, also, these patients can describe a sour taste in the mouth. That's just the stomach acid. Uh, they may also describe it as metal-like. Peptic ulcer disease is going to be epigastric pain. Uh, so always good to have the patient point to where the pain is and describe the pain, the nature of the pain. A lot of times these patients will have a history of aspirin or NSAID use. So look at patients who uh, are chronic pain or maybe patients who take a daily as uh, aspirin for, uh, for preventative purposes. Um, also look for belching and bloating. Cholecystitis is classically right upper quadrant. So again, you can see here that the location of the pain, if they can pinpoint it, it's really going to help with your differential. Look for the four Fs. So this isn't always the case that patients always fall into these, certainly, but I've looked at a lot of the questions on USMLE World and on the practice tests, and they do love to give you the classic patient, and that is fat, female, fertile, and 40. So look for 46-year-old, she's still having her period, She's BMI of 29. Uh, that would be your typical uh, patient with cholecystitis. Also look for a positive Murphy sign. That's uh, very consistent with cholecystitis. And then esophageal spasm. Now this can look a lot like gastroesophageal reflux disease in that you've got a pain that is kind of radiating along that esophagus down the midline. A lot of times these patients will have a history of dysphagia or regurgitation. Now this is different than the kind of more vomiting uh, issue that we see with reflux. This is regurgitation. So the food will come back and won't be acidic. It'll just be the food coming back up from the esophagus. You want to look at the history, look for any uh, GI symptoms in the past consistent with dysphagia or regurgitation. A lot of times this pain is going to be very severe. and we think of things like aortic dissection, uh, aortic aneurysm, MI, because the pain is similar to that kind of crushing, uh, agonizing pain. And so in many cases, we give them nitroglycerin and the pain goes away. And so uh, remember that esophageal spasm is a differential. Uh, however, when we do the EKG, as we invariably will, when you have a patient with that kind of pain, it will come back normal. On the other hand, if you have a patient with an MI, it won't be normal. Costochondritis is typically easy to pick out. Uh, it can happen in patients of any age, uh, especially patients who are perhaps doing a, uh, a, an exercise routine uh, where they're using some of those muscles. Uh, the thing with costochondritis that will really be uh, make this apparent is that it's a point tenderness. So. It will be located in one spot, and you can reproduce the pain by pressing on that region, and that is costochondritis. Anytime you can press on something and, uh, and, and you can elicit the pain, that's typically soft tissue or bone pain, and so that would be costochondritis here. Respiratory causes, so some of these can be a little bit more severe uh, than, than the previous two, uh, GI and, and muscular causes. So with pulmonary embolism, what you're going to look for is a sudden increase in respiratory rate. These patients are going to be uh, are going to be hypoxic. They're going to be uh, they're going to feel like they're not getting enough air. Uh, look for dyspnea and also look for calf swelling. Uh, if you push up their their uh, their feet, so uh, uh, you'd be doing uh, um, so you push their their feet up towards their legs. Uh, what you're looking there for is is pain in their calves, and that's Homan's sign. You may see that. Uh, so that's that's just dorsal flexion of of the of the foot on on uh, each uh, leg. So uh, you'll want to look for that on USMLE. Uh, and then pain and respiration. Uh, that's typical of, of any of the, of the respiratory causes of uh, chest pain. 
pleuritis, uh, you'll have pain on respiration, and you'll also have accompanying fever, rapid shallow breathing, and a scratchy sh sound on auscultation of the lung. So this is not pericarditis, this is pleuritis, so you're not going to hear it specifically over the heart, you're going to hear this also on the uh, on, uh, on the back uh, when you're doing auscultation of the lungs. So you'll hear that scratchy kind of frictiony rub sound uh, and that's uh, specific for pleuritus. Uh, pneumothorax, the giveaway here is that you're going to have, uh, if you get a chest x-ray, which wouldn't be the first step, you will have deviation of the, of the uh, mediastinum towards uh, one side or the other. Uh, you may have a history of rib fracture, a penetrating wound, or a young and tall patient, um, but this is going to be really sudden, and the dead giveaway on physical exam here is that you're going to have an absent breath sound on one side or the other. So any of those things keep in mind for pneumothorax. Uh, for pneumonia, you'll have a fever, uh, and then increased white blood cells, crackles, and rails. Uh, and usually this is going to be something that's developed insidiously. This isn't going to be sudden uh, like pulmonary embolism or pneumothorax. So pleuritis and pneumonia think of as more insidious and pulmonary embolism and pneumothorax think of as more acute. Okay, so the cardiac causes. So these are uh, arguably some of the most important and, uh, and the most difficult to distinguish. So just basic stable angina is going to be acute substernal chest pain that improves with rest. So I just put angina here, but that should say stable angina. So stable angina improves with rest. And we'll talk about angina uh, more in detail uh, in another section. Unstable angina is acute substernal chest pain that does not improve with rest or that's lasted for uh, greater than 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, there's, it's very difficult to, to uh, distinguish unstable angina from uh, NSTEMI. Uh, so there's two different types of myocardial infarctions, STEMI and NSTEMI. And clinically, these are the same as unstable angina. So on physical exam, when looking at the patient, uh, you're not going to be able to tell the difference uh, between this and angina. Uh, when you, uh, the, the, the difference between myocardial infarction and angina uh, or unstable angina is going to be that in myocardial infarction, you'll always have elevated uh, cardiac enzymes. Now, cardiac enzymes don't always come back right away. So in order to tell the difference between unstable angina and, uh, and STEMI, uh, is that you're going to have, on your EKG, you're going to have ST elevation. So you can probably see here that unstable angina and NSTEMI, uh, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between the, uh, the two of those right away because the difference is going to be on cardiac enzymes. Uh, with STEMI, you're going to see the, uh, the diagnosis right away because you'll have ST elevation on EKG. Uh, so these three make up a triad, unstable angina, and STEMI, and STEMI. Uh, they make up a triad uh, known as the acute coronary syndromes. And uh, we'll talk about these in greater detail. They're going to be treated in very similar ways. Um, but uh, it will be very important to know how to distinguish the difference. Myocarditis is a chronic cardiac pain. Uh, it'll generally be pretty vague and it'll be more mild. So these patients aren't going to be doubling over in pain. And a lot of these patients, because it is an inflammation, they will have fever. Pericarditis is a positional chest pain. So the dead giveaway here is that these patients, when you come in to, to see these patients in the ED, they're going to be recumbent. So they'll be laying down and uh, when you tell them to get up, they're going to be grunting in pain. So these patients are going to be laying down, they're going to be having shallow breaths. Why? Because this pain is pleuritic. So deeper breaths they take, the more pain they're in. So pleuritic pain that's positional and worse with sitting up, think of pericarditis. Any of the, uh, any of the uh, 
the chest pains that start with P, so pericarditis, pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, uh, pleurisy, they're all going to be uh, positional. Or, I'm sorry, they're all going to be pleuritic. So, uh, but only pericarditis will be positional. And then uh, pericarditis, you'll also see some specific uh, EKG anomalies. So uh, we'll talk about that more when we discuss EKGs, um, specific readings. And then pericarditis, these patients will also describe this pain as sharp, but that doesn't necessarily distinguish it from uh, any of the other chest pains. Dissecting aortic aneurysm, this is classically defined as a tearing pain and it radiates to the back. So yes, you do have substernal chest pain here, just like angina, just like myocarditis, just like pericarditis, but uh, dissecting aortic aneurysms are going to radiate to the back and that's unique. Mitral valve prolapse is really not ever an emergency, but these patients sometimes will come in. Uh, they tend to be in females, and they also tend to have a, uh, a high likelihood to have anxiety. And this is a transient pain, so these patients will have pain, but it will come and go, and it might not be associated with rest. And on physical exam, you'll note a mid-systolic click, and that's associated with the mitral valve prolapse. So uh, one thing that I want to point out right now uh, is the inferior wall myocardial infarction. So this will either be an end STEMI or a STEMI, uh, but it will be a myocardial infarction. And what you're going to see here is you're going to see sudden substernal severe crushing pain not relieved with rest, so your typical unstable angina pain. Uh, but you're also going to have some unique symptoms. And what you'll see in inferior wall myocardial infarction, not all of them, but in, uh, in some of them, and particularly only in the inferior wall myocardial infarctions, are uh, a symptom triad of bradycardia, diarrhea, and lightheadedness. And this you wouldn't think of coming with myocardial infarction. What the heck? Myocardial infarction is in the heart. Why are we getting... Uh, well, bradycardia, but why are we getting diarrhea and lightheadedness? And the reason, so when we have uh, an inferior wall myocardial infarction, the uh, vessel that's affected is the poster posterior descending artery. So it's important to remember uh, what the, uh, the arteries that are affected are in the different myocardial infarctions. So the three we see the most are uh, posterior wall MI, anterior wall MI, and inferior wall MI. So the anterior wall MI, posterior wall MI, and the lateral MI are all due to uh, are all due to branches of the uh, of the left coronary artery. The inferior wall MI is due to uh, the posterior, uh, an occlusion of the posterior descending artery, which comes off the right coronary artery. And the posterior descending artery affects the, uh, the posterior part of the heart. So when you look at the anatomy, and this is, uh, so the heart is covered here with, uh, with pericardium, uh, but this is a posterior view of the heart. And this is the area, this is the region right here that the, uh, that the uh, posterior descending artery uh, supplies. And so when you have an infarction in the posterior descending artery, you're going to get irritation of the posterior heart. And the left branch of the vagus nerve comes right down with the esophagus uh, uh, behind the, the heart. And so what happens is that the vagus nerve becomes irritated. And when the vagus nerve becomes irritated, we get these symptoms of bradycardia, diarrhea, and lightheadedness. So these are three things to think about. Um, if you see these with unstable angina-like symptoms, you should be thinking inferior wall MI. Now, it's a lot easier to, to diagnose inferior wall MI with an EKG. You're going to see uh, changes in specific leads. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to, to the section on acute coronary syndromes. So just going over it once again, uh, this is the differential uh, for chest pain uh, and you should be uh, 
aware of, of all of these specific causes. Uh, we're not going to talk about the psychiatric causes. Uh, if you want to know about that, you can look at the, the psychiatry lectures um, and uh, you can get a really good idea of, of what all those are. And that is uh, it. So in summary, um, always take into account the patient's age, their physical state, uh, the history, the physical exam, and the patient's risk factors. And then from there, you can make a presumptive diagnosis. So important to remember the risk factors for MI. MI should be at the forefront of your mind because it is the most common cardiac cause of chest pain. Uh, so age, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, past history of MI, high cholesterol, tobacco use, obesity, stress, and illegal drug use, uh, which is cocaine. Uh, and I didn't, these are not in order, uh, these are just in random order, so they're not in any specific order. Uh, your next step will almost always in any patient uh, will be to be, get an EKG since MI is the most deadly uh, cause on the differential diagnosis, and EKGs are easy to get in, and they're very fast, they come back right away. So uh, the only exceptions uh, where getting an EKG will not be the first step is if the patient is young and they don't have any risk factors for MI and the patient has very clear symptoms that point towards an alternative diagnosis. So uh, for instance, if the, pa uh, if the patient complains of a sour taste in their mouth and heartburn, you think GERD, if they've got a tearing pain that radiates to the back, uh, and they have weak lower extremity pulses, then you're going to want to get a CT to diagnose aortic aneurysm. Or if they have pain that's not acute, if they come in and they say, I've got chest pain, but it's been going on for days or weeks, that's not going to be an MI. You don't even get an EKG for that. So we'll expand on more of these causes in the next sections. I will see you there.